You're watching 12 WKRC TV, a new generation of news. 12 Newsmakers starts now. Good morning and welcome to Newsmakers. It is uncomfortable to be reminded of our failures, but it is dangerous to forget them. That's why the placement of this memorial plaque is so questionable. Buried inside an obscure courtyard at University Hospital, the plaque contains the names of many of the men and women who died because of Cold War radiation experiments carried out between 1960 and 1972 in the bowels of old General Hospital at the behest of the military. The government and the medical establishment has always preferred these names and their fate go unnoticed. This plaque is not much more than a grudging recognition of the 12 years of human experimentation. That's why the publication of this book, The Treatment, the story of those who died in the Cincinnati radi radiation test, is potentially so important. In 1994, as the implications of those radiation experiments were becoming known, the Lexington Herald Leader did an extensive article on the fate of one victim, Mary Hamp Hampton Singleton of Mount Vernon, Kentucky, near Lexington. In an accompanying editorial, the paper wrote this, and I read from the book. Nobody's likely to build a monument to Mary Hampton, but maybe someone should. It would help to remind everyone of just what government of the people, by the people, and for the people did to some of the people three decades ago. The government wasn't interested in curing Mary Hampton. It wanted information on how radiation would affect soldiers on the battlefield. This book documenting the story across three decades rather than some hard to find plaque has the potential to become the real memorial capable of reminding all of us of our willingness as individuals and as institutions to actively subvert and quietly compromise our values when faced by a perceived threat. I am joined this morning by the author of the treatment, Martha Stevens. Martha, welcome actually back to Newsmakers, although from 1994 when, uh, when I was not the, uh, the host here, but uh, congratulations on your book. Well, thank you. Um, let's make it clear. This book is being published, uh, it actually will come out in the, the bookstores next month in March, very right. soon here. Uh, this case was, as you say, closed in 1999, mm -hmm. but it was not unknown. In your life, this mm -hmm. case goes back all the way to 1971 and 72. Mm -hmm. How did mm -hmm. you get involved in this originally? Mm -hmm. Well, I happened to learn in the fall of 1971 through a little piece in the Village Voice that something was being done on my campus involving poor cancer patients, uh, some kind of experiments, and they were being sponsored by the Department of Defense. And I decided to look into the matter and uh, I went over to the medical college several times to visit with the dean, um, the, I'm sorry, the director of the medical center, Edward Gull, and uh, he finally coughed up the documents. Gave Pretty me amazingly. Gave copies of everything. Yes, it was. It was quite amazing. I, I, I've wondered all this time why he actually did give them to me. Because in the next 30 years, that was about the only time anybody coughed yeah, up documents that's without, right. being, without being for <laughs> well, And that resulted right. in this paper uh, that yeah. you wrote. You mm -hmm. were a faculty member in the English department. Yeah. Um, and you wrote mm -hmm. this paper and presented it in a very public way. But what happened? Uh, yeah, it was read by a colleague of mine at a press conference that a little group of us uh, held, a, a group called the Junior Faculty Association, they decided to issue the a report I had written about the test. And uh, we didn't get a lot of publicity to the press conference, it, and people had no way of knowing the, the nightmarish events that would be described there. So uh, we did have some publicity. There was scattered publicity around the country. There was some in the New York Times, the Washington Post, but in town, the story was suppressed. And uh, the people involved, the families of the victims, and in fact, there were still victims alive at that time, um, had no way of knowing what had happened to them. So in 1972, it was possible to know that there was something going on here. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. but lo scattered reports, as you point out in the book, scattered mm -hmm. reports nationally, nothing locally. 
and the yeah. story essentially dies locally. Did right. any good, though, come from that initial report? Well, yes. Um, we helped to bring a halt to the experiments. People were still being irradiated. Let's, let's make clear that people understand, and I don't want to go through all mm -hmm. the details. I want people to read the book. But mm -hmm. what was actually happening to people? Well, people that were coming to cancer clinics, outpatient clinics mainly, outpatient clinics at what was then General Hospital were being drawn into these special experiments. They didn't even know that they were guinea pigs. They thought they were being treated for cancer when they were taken down to the uh, to basement uh, special chambers in, in the basement of General Hospital and given in one dose large doses of either whole body or half body radiation. Now let's be clear, today we hear about radiation treatment for cancer patients that is very mm -hmm. focused if anybody yeah. has ever experienced it or had a friend who has mm -hmm. gone through this or it, it's very targeted. We're talking mm -hmm. the whole body is exposed, yeah. not any attempt mm -hmm. to localize it and focus it on the cancerous That's right. part of the body. Right. This was very odd because people had breast cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer, uh, often they had already had radiation to their tumor. A very different kind of radiation. Right. Much higher doses. You can give much higher doses to a tumor. But to have uh, radiation to your whole body when you have a solid tumor was not, not uh, considered not appropriate. And they, it was given in one dose. And those doses you know? ranged over the years. This went on for, for 12 years. Those mm -hmm. doses ranged from 100 to 150 to 200, in some cases even 250 yes. rads. Uh -huh. which right. is a, and, and what really was the purpose of, of that process? What were they really doing? These, this uh -huh. isn't really treatment. <laughs> well, right. Uh, this, is a, this is a title uh, with a load of irony, of course, the, the treatment. Uh, the doctors have claimed over the years mainly that they were giving it as uh, experimental cancer treatment for palliation, they will say. But it's always been a, a question, how in the world could you provide any pain relief with that kind of dose to a tumor, which would not be enough to shrink a tumor? Uh, the real reason was that the Defense Department wanted to know what would happen to soldiers in a nuclear war. So if, nu if soldiers were exposed to mm -hmm. radiation in a nuclear war, they wanted to know what the levels were. And supposedly they were yeah. looking for some indicators of yeah. you know, urine right. samples or blood so they could determine what That's would happen right. to those soldiers exactly. after exposure. That's Did it. they ever find that? Uh, Did no. these tests ever prove useful at really, all to uh, that? Well, not really. Not really, no. The dosimeter or the indicator of, of uh, uh, damage uh, to, uh, to from the radiation, they never found that. They wanted to have a way where they could take a, a soldier who had been exposed to a nuclear bomb and test him quickly to see how much radiation he had absorbed. They never found that. One of the, you break this book into three parts, sort of the story mm -hmm. about how the whole story unfolds in the public's mind, the right. medical story, and then the legal story. Right. And we said that you wrote your paper in 1972, or read your paper in 1972, then this story sort of goes underground until mm -hmm. 1994 when right. a series of things happened and one of those I'm very proud to say and I didn't know this when I first called you Channel 12 and Peg Rasconi mm -hmm. had a role right. and I want to go back mm -hmm. to that in late 1993 the Albuquerque Tribune reported about Cold War radiation experiments in New Mexico a few days later an anonymous tip alerted former Channel 12 reporter Peg Rasconi of similar experimentation done 22 years earlier at the University of Cincinnati. On January the 4th, 1994, Peg prepared this report. Senator Edward Kennedy in the early 70s led subcommittee hearings on the Human Radiation Project and the experiments at UC. In the transcript is a report written by this woman, Martha Stevens, a UC English professor who back then was a member of the Junior Faculty Association. That group obtained and studied the university's records on the experiments, leading her 20 years ago to question whether the 87 participants were ever properly informed. The only way that a consent form could have been uh, uh, valid, in our view, <laughs> would be if it said, you may die of radiation sickness within 40 days of your treatment. And of course, none said that, because they, they wouldn't have had any subjects. 
In fact, the university's own investigative panel found that, quote, prior to 1965, consent forms were not used by the study group, but verbal consent was obtained. The university's panel found no wrongdoing occurred during the experiments. Twenty years later, Martha Stevens still questions that conclusion. There was a pause in the experiments at the time we found out about them, analyzed them, and made our report, and said that we felt that at least seven people died of radiation injury. And the, uh, they were, there was never any more irradiations after our report. But uh, the university panel, even though it seemed to clear the doctors of hurting anybody, it did not recommend continuing. You know, and it makes you wonder, well, why not if everything was okay? How important was that report? How important was Peg Rusconi's work? Oh, well, um, I, I, the, whole, the whole first part of this book is given over to uh, out uh, sketching uh, what happened in the press, because to me that's a terribly important part. Uh, we might never have known anything about what happened here. And by the way, I mentioned seven deaths on that particular clip, but there were 21 people who died within about a month of being irradiated. Uh, but the Channel 12, uh, I tell you, I could hardly believe that that was happening at the time. You know, one of the things you mentioned earlier in our conversation that in 72 the story was suppressed. And, yeah. and you talk about right. the story being suppressed, but you also, not just Peg Rusconi, but people at the Post, at the Enquirer, Mm -hmm. at Channel 9, at other p news outlets, mm -hmm. individual reporters mm -hmm. actually yeah. do pursue this story uh, once they get their teeth I'll onto it. i tell you, it was a great pleasure to see what skill, what talent we do have among our young reporters. They took hold of this. They knew it was a serious, uh, couldn't be more serious. Uh, and they treated it with great respect, but when they decided that uh, certain things had happened, they were determined to tell about them. You know, and that's an interesting thing. So often the media gets slammed, and there really is a difference mm -hmm. between that frontline reporter and some sort of organizational Absolutely. decisions about what gets reported and what doesn't. Absolutely. I mean, I'm among, I think, many people who wish that we had the kind of information system and media in this country that would allow us to really put to work all this young talent that we have for, for telling us the truth about what's happening in our country. We're going to take a break, but stay right there. This story was then and is now about real people. Stay tuned. After the break, I'll be joined by two children of one of the victims of the radiation experiments. Black and white, the clinical summaries from the radiation experiments at Cincinnati General Hospital detail treatments and conditions of patients who are identified only by number and initials. People should know that these aren't just numbers and initials like what everybody has. Mm -hmm. These are real people. These are, you know, these are families. The last dose that they gave him uh, in 65, uh, they burnt him up really bad. And uh, his chest was all burnt. The hair was burnt off his chest and we used to have to put like Vaseline on him and he couldn't stand any any clothing next to him. And she would shake so hard the whole bed would shake and she was just racked with pain, racked with pain. Mm -hmm. um, my mother and I had taken her January the 18th and she passed March the 11th. Welcome back. It was not just those who received the whole body radiation who suffered. Family members had to endure the suffering and deaths of husbands, wives, mothers, and fathers. Then decades later, those same families suffered again when they had to come to grips with the revelation that what had been presented as treatment turned out to be something quite different. Maud Jacobs, identified only by the initials MJ in the original documents, had cancer, but in 1964 was still at home caring for her seven children. She took herself to the hospital in a taxi for a treatment, whole body radiation. She died 25 days later. Her children were left motherless. The younger ones were distributed by Catholic charities to several foster families. Martha Stevens and I are now joined 
by two people whose mother died in a Cold War experimentation. Lillian Pagano is the daughter of Maud Jacobs. Bob Phillips is the son of Maud Jacobs. Welcome to Newsmakers, and thank you for being here this morning. Um, Lillian, do you remember that fateful 25 days? And do, did you think at the time anything was unusual? No, I didn't. I thought she just had cancer. I had no idea that what had taken place. I was taking care of the children while she took a cab to the hospital for this treatment. And when she came back, she was, it was awful. It was just terrible. She just, she had to hold a bucket. And I said, Mom, what, what is that? She said, I don't know, it's just something they gave me for, to, to help me. She never had no idea. You don't think she in any sense gave consent no way. to what was done to no, her? No, she had young children that she had, had to, to plan for. Okay. <laughs> Bob, how old were you at the time? I was 31. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? 31. Okay. And did you have any sense of what was going on? Not really, but after after it was all over, I could look back and I could see things that seemed strange. For one thing, the place where they had her, the the hospital rooms, was more elaborate than some of the other places in that hospital. Did and you have some sense that they were doing special experimentation or special treatment. documentation, uh, uh, blood, urine work, whatever? Actually, I thought treatment. Uh, you know, for they were treating her for the cancer. But then, I, but after I seen a few things, and a, just thinking back on it, I kind of figured that you know something was. I could see where something was going wrong. Now it was years, decades later, before you got official word uh, uh, about what had happened. Approximately thirty years. Ago. And how how did you find out? And what was your reaction at the time that you found out? It was just hard to believe, even though I would suspected something. It was still hard to believe because. Uh, I just couldn't figure our country doing this to the people who were individuals and had nothing to do with anything, uh, just trying to make a living. And William, how, when, when you found out what had actually happened in the, in the mid-90s, um, did you have a chance to talk to any of those officials, doctors, government officials, uh, congressmen, anybody no, no. ever come to you and just sit down and no. talk with you about no what way. happened? No. I was in complete denial when I found out about my mother, uh, about this radiation stuff. I, I was in complete denial. I, I just wouldn't, I refused to believe it. The children would call me and they'd say, Mom, it's happening. It's happened. I said, no, it hasn't. I was there with her. Because of the reports they were, they were hearing on the news, in the yes. papers, and that sort of thing. <clears throat> That's it. Mm -hmm. And then... When I come to really realize that it, it had really happened, I still was, I still didn't yeah. want to believe it. I well, still didn't. We went to Capitol Hill and went around to some of the congressmen, and we didn't really even get to talk to the congressmen. We talked to their aides, and nothing was ever changed or done anything about. We was trying to get a law through, pass a law that would they could be punished for this that everybody involved would be punished. And uh, nothing ever happened. They just kind of ignored us and shook our hands and smiled at us. You know, on that point, uh, Martha, in the book, you talk a lot about there's lots of parallels here but with what happened in Cincinnati and what happened in Nazi Germany with medical experimentation and the whole case, whole issue of the Nuremberg precedents and the Nuremberg trials. Right now, we have the world court sitting and talking about war crime trials. At, you, at, at this point in your lives, do you think these things are, what happened here at General Hospital are comparable and that people, individuals should be held responsible? Exactly. Exactly. Um, I remember what L Lillian said, um, or at least quoted in, the, in, in one of the papers, when she first learned what had happened to her mother. She said, well, this is like Hitler. 
This is like the Holocaust. Um, of course, there are parallels. Yes, I mean, the the the, the Nazi doctors who were tried in Nuremberg. Um, as it turned out, they they had uh, felt that they were doing useful experiments, and they thought that if they uh, if they dropped people from planes or they uh, they froze people to death, they're prisoners of war and all. If they if they froze them to death, they were trying to learn about freezing. That that was a decent thing to do, or at least that's the way they had presented it to their own medical communities. So I mean, I do see a parallel there. Of course, this is a tiny scale compared to what happened to, uh, to in the Holocaust. What do you? Th how has this changed your relationship to the medical profession, the the organization, the institutions of our society, but particularly the medical? Profession? Well, I believe there's good and there's bad, but this 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 makes you have doubt as to even go for a cold if you get a if you. Get pneumonia, or, or is the doctor going to be doing right, or is he going to put you through an experiment? Bob, what about you? That's what I think this should teach everybody, that there, everything that the doctor says is not gospel. It's take it, some is good and some is bad. You never know. But I'd, I would always look into it. I'd always at, maybe ask for a second opinion. Now, the interesting thing, one of the themes in your book, Martha, is that you were always sort of, brushed off as well you weren't a doc you weren't a medical doctor mm -hmm. and therefore you didn't know mm -hmm. what do you think sort of a fundamental lesson about the relationship of ordinary people to the medical profession mm -hmm. or ordinary people to the areas of expertise and mm -hmm. the and the institutions in our society well let me say this i i say in the book and i i believe this that the only way we could possibly protect ourselves against this kind of vicious exploitation is to have, like all other developed countries, a national health service where people, all people, can choose their own doctors at least. They won't be trapped in uh, public uh, hospitals or low budget HMOs or special clinics for poor people. They won't be trapped in those. And of course, that's where most experimentation takes place. So I, I'm a strong, I always have been a strong advocate of national health service. And uh, I tell you, uh, one of the members of the uh, advisory commission, Dr. Jay Katz, a retired professor of law and medicine at Yale, uh, m insisted that the advisory commission study the current, that is, two th uh, 1995, 94, 95, IRBs, that is, review pr pr uh, proposals in hospitals, to see if today, at that time at least, there were still a whole lot of problems in the way they're experimenting on people. And he found that at least half of them were potentially um, dangerous uh, to the people being studied, and that nobody cared what their quality of health would be after the tests. I, I have less than a minute left, but uh, Lily and Bob, there was a court settlement on this. There were some financial settlements. There was that monument that was put yes. up, memorial. What do you think of the settlements very quickly, William? Well, I, I think the, it, <clears throat> the one thing is I don't, uh, I don't really think it was really justified <coughs> as far as settlement <coughs> concern. They can't pay for my mother. They can't bring her back. But I was really happy and real happy about the uh, plaque. At least I had something Very quickly, there. Bob, because I'm just and, and another thing that I'd like to point out, that we, we, part of the settlement was that this never happened again. And yeah. perhaps yeah. that might help. Okay. I want to make sure that everybody understands the book is going to be in bookstores next week or next month in March, The Treatment. Thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. This is the last time the sh uh, on this show uh, that one of the key behind the scenes staff members will be with us. Harold Christ has been a television engineer since 1968. His job is to make sure the right tapes roll at the right time, usually. Despite the fact that he is still very young, Harold is retiring next week, a reality he has reminded all of us about daily for the last two years as his clock for retirement has clicked down. What Harold really does is keep everybody in this building smiling and laughing at themselves. 
I know I will miss his quick wit, gentle teasing, and total confidence. Harold, have fun in retirement. Everybody else, keep working, but have a good week anyway. Thank you.